Ladies and gentlemen, at 7 p.m. I'll be called to order the meeting of the Merrimack Planning Board for Tuesday, March 3rd, 2020. Let me remind everyone who will address the board to sign in on the clipboard on the table in front of me. And uh, I think we already turned the microphones on for you, but make sure they're on and you bring it close to you so the folks at home can hear you. Um, let's see. Our next planning board meeting after tonight is March 17th uh, at 7 p.m in this room, the Matthew Thornton room. Uh, I will appoint Nelson into a voting position tonight, substituting for Lynn. We have four members, which achieves a quorum. Uh, with that in mind, our next item on the agenda is the Planning and Zoning Administrator's Report. Robert, have you a report for us? Uh, a couple of small items, Mr. Chair. Uh, last meeting, I told the board that we needed to reschedule the Zoning Amendment public hearing to April 7th. Uh, Tim has to move that again to April 21st due to another scheduling conflict. So I just wanted to let everyone know of that. And the second item is to, uh, that staff 21st. recommends. 21st. Yes, April 21st. So it's okay. being pushed back another two weeks. Um, and the next one is that we recommend that the Stewart lot line adjustment, Stewart site plan, and PMG site plan are not of regional impact. Excellent. What's the will of the board with respect to the staff's recommendation on regional impact of the two plans before us tonight? Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we accept the staff's recommendation as printed. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Disco. If there's no discussion, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? 400 to find that the projects on tonight's agenda are not of regional impact. Any other items, Robert? Any questions by members of the board for staff? Seeing none. Um, I don't know if at this point in the meeting, since we haven't dealt with our business yet, but um, as a part of this um, planning and zoning administrator's report, my understanding is that our next meeting two weeks hence has no agenda items at the moment. That is correct. And if that continues to be the case, then uh, you should be aware that we probably would not have our second meeting of the month this month. Um, but we'll see how things play out here tonight. Um, if there are no other questions for the staff, that brings us to the next item on our agenda, which is Petroleum Marketing Group, Inc. as the applicant and owner in its review for acceptance and consideration of a site plan to raise and rebuild an existing gas station and convenience store. The parcels located at 1 Continental Boulevard in the C2 General Commercial and Aquifer Conservation Districts, tax map 4D, about 541. It is case number PB 2020 6. Robert, is there anything that we need to know before we hear from the applicant? Uh, just for the board's information, late this afternoon, uh, staff was provided with comments, uh, review comments from Fuss and O'Neill, as well as review comments from the Public Works Department. Uh, obviously, neither of these made it into the memo that you have before you in your packets that I put together. Uh, however, based on the uh, type and volume of comments from Public Works and also Fuss and O'Neill, uh, staff is changing the recommendation from the board accepting the application to hearing the presentation tonight, letting them speak, asking the questions, interacting, but not accepting it yet until plans can be revised and cleaned up to address a lot of these comments. Uh, it, it just appears that the number of errors that are here and the issues that are being raised are uh, such that acceptance is not recommended at this time. Thank you, Robert, for that. Um, and could with we ask, that, could we ask Robert has the um, applicant? All right, you, you've answered <laughs> my question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. And. Um, with that, please introduce yourself and tell us about the project, and I'm excited already to hear about it because I think rebuilding that gas station would be a fantastic idea. Excellent. Well, good evening. My name is Courtney Harris. I'm with the law firm of Shea and Finney in Manchester. Um, here with Jesse Coakley from the engineering firm Maser Consulting, and also here tonight with us uh, is Gary Kilfeather from the applicant PMG. Um, and so I'll turn it over to Jesse. You can talk about, about the plans, but we really just wanted to present things to you folks. As you know, we, we've submitted an application for site plan review and for certain associated waivers. Um, obviously haven't had a chance yet to see the comments uh, that, that Robert just gave us and we'll certainly take those into account, but want to hear from you folks as well. Great. All right, tell us about the project. Good evening again. My name is Jesse Coakley. I'm a project manager with Mazer Consulting, the engineer of record for the project. 
Um, what I have on the easel here is basically just a um, overlay of the site layout plan sheet uh, three in your set on top of a Google Arial, um, but it's been colorized to kind of reflect what it would uh, what it would look like. So. Um, the site itself is located at One Continental Boulevard. It's the intersection of Continental Boulevard and Camp Sargent Road. For the board's edification, the Continental Boulevard's at the top of the page here, running uh, west to east there. North is north is up here, and Camp Sargent runs uh, north south there. Um, the site is approximately 0 0.82 acres. Um, it's located in the C2 General Commercial Zone. Um, as well as the Aquifer Conservation District. <clears throat> um, it is surrounded by commercial uses, and then I believe on the opposite side of Camp Sargent, I believe is uh, New Hampshire DOT uh, right-of-way lands there. Uh, the existing conditions at the site include a approximate 1,800 square foot convenience store um, and a canopy with four multi-product dispensers. Uh, we use the abbreviation MPD to that effect. Um, there are three existing curb cuts at the site, one on Continental Boulevard and two on Camp Sargent. What we're proposing to do is raise and rebuild the site with uh, approximately 3,600 square foot convenience store uh, that also has a drive-through component to it. Um, and we were at a pre-app meeting, I think, with this uh, board for like conceptual review back in June of last year. Um, and we did take into account some of the comments from that, uh, from that meeting, which included a bypass lane for the drive-through, um, some right turn arrows for the driveway entrances, um, <clears throat> and um, providing enough room for stacking for, uh, for 10 vehicles at, at the drive-through itself. The new canopy on site will also have six multi-product dispensers. Um, we are proposing to have <clears throat> um, 22 parking spaces, 10 striped at the front of the convenience store, and then with the six pump locations, that provides another 12 um, spaces available. We are reducing the number of curb cuts for the site from three down to two. We're basically keeping the one on Continental Boulevard approximately in the same location, which is on like the, uh, at the northwest corner. <clears throat> on Camp Sargent, we are gonna consolidate it down to one curb cut that's going to be kind of located in between the two that exist there today. Um, so we'll move slightly further from the intersection. Again, both will be um, right in, right out as the, uh, as the roads themselves have the medians kind of preventing any left turn movements, obviously. Um, <clears throat> we did also submit a, uh, a traffic impact study uh, that demonstrates the proposed development has adequate on-site circulation parking and stacking um, <clears throat> we also included in the in the site plans uh, numerous vehicle turning um, templates that were requested at the original meeting showing that there's adequate circulation on site for the delivery vehicles the um, emergency vehicles etc so <clears throat> those were all included as well we are proposing um, some stormwater mitigation for the slight increase in impervious coverage at the site Obviously, with the um, Aquifer Conservation District, we do have to go to Conservation Commission um, for review there. Um, the landscaping design does utilize um, natural nativized species. Um, we do have a few waivers with respect to the landscaping design, um, mostly a function of the use and layout uh, of the site. Um, I can go into those in detail. They were submitted in writing, but I'll, I'll do that when I finish my, my overall summary here because the lighting plan does use um, LED, dark sky compliant, uh, full cutoff, you know, energy efficient fixtures. We do have a couple of waivers associated with that aspect of the plan as well. Um, <clears throat> so I can go through those. We also included uh, conceptual floor plans and elevations of the building. Uh, that were in the set. I think they um, kind of lend itself to a New England style of architecture with um, some clapboard siding, shingled roofs, pitched roofs, um, and some stone wainscot at the base of the uh, of the of the building. So those will continue to be developed, um, you know, as we go here, and obviously submitted for 
for building permit review, et cetera. But um, as Mr. Price alluded to, you know, we just got these comments today, so we welcome the board's feedback. Any questions you have, if you want me to go through the specific waivers, I can do that uh, as well. Excellent. Thank you for the overall presentation. I do want to learn more about your waivers. Um, I think that the staff's recommendation is to uh, gather up some information here tonight and provide some feedback to you guys on any details, uh, but put off the question of accepting the application as complete and um, allow some of the comments to be fulfilled. Um, thank you for providing the elevations that show the building. I think it is uh, obviously a far more attractive uh, proposed building than what's there now, which is you know, probably a 1950s style gas station there. Um, I am interested to know about um, the aesthetic uh, approach to the canopy itself and whether it kind of matches that same architecture or avoids that sort of neon flat square style that you see on some of the gas stations done today where the canopy itself almost forms signage and that sort of thing. And hopefully we've got a, a reasonably attractive approach to that that's suitable with the neighborhood. So we will uh, provide a, kind of the signage package. Uh, the canopy itself is usually something that is um, dictated by the gas brand that would be chosen there. Um, I believe this is going to remain a Gulf station. Um, they just kind of issued some new rebranding for um, their signage. Um, it does include probably what I would call like a more modern looking canopy. It is like the square style. Um, that would be what we would propose here. So it wouldn't um, necessarily match the building architecture, but um, we can provide elevation views of that for, for your consideration. Yeah, show us some elevations and see what it looks like, and we'll kind of offer you some feedback on that. Um, I We've had some experience, and I've certainly seen some other boards around that um, push back on the uh, notion that various brands choose their way that they want their buildings laid out, and there's nothing we can do about it. And yet, sometimes there's some flexibility in those that people might manage to find in certain towns. And so, anyway, as long as it looks nice, I, I think that's what we'd be looking for. It's not so bright or glaring or glow in the dark, neon kind of a thing. Um, the other thing that I noticed from the plan set that you provided, and I didn't take a deep dive into it, um, it seems that the um, truck maneuver um, plan that you have um, has the truck entering from the Continental Boulevard entrance and making a circle around the canopy. And it, it seems to be an extraordinarily tight movement pattern. Um, that could be difficult to actually execute when there's cars and people on the site. Um, tell me a little bit more about that particular aspect of it and um, why you <clears throat> made the choices that you made. So because they are, you know, they have a number of stores in the area and throughout, um, you know, the northeast, et cetera, and up and down the east coast, and um, they do have some control over when these deliveries can occur. So a lot of times the fuel delivery will be set at like an off-peak time when the store would not be so heavily trafficked by pedestrians or customers, um, if you will. So it does give some extra um, affordability for the truck driver to be able to either circulate the site, back in, get his maneuver that he needs to be able to line up over the tanks and, and, and fill them underground. Same thing with any um, deliveries that they might receive. They can try to schedule those or trash pickups that would happen kind of off peak so that it would not, you know, disrupt. You could the get operation. used to your deliveries and the trash pickup. I don't think that's quite as large a truck as the fuel delivery truck. Correct. Those are smaller. Those are going to be manageable. And this is, there's not a lot of residential. You're pretty far away from getting the residential on Camp Sergeant. And you're not going to have backup alarms and things that really trouble people with dumpsters mm -hmm. and those deliveries but the fuel truck itself um, as you the pattern that you've drawn on sheet one of one for the vehicle turning exhibit um, you know actually looks like it touches the handicap space and then at the same time as touch is under the canopy and very near the pump and virtually touches the um, landscape island along the continental boulevard aspect the whole way around that turn um, to get into place and 
Uh, truck drivers are good. Seems like you're asking a lot of them. Yeah. What we have found is also, you know, that that turning template does come with, like, some restrictions that um, are built into the program. The truck drivers can maneuver it somewhat better than what is shown on there. That's kind of, like, a worst-case scenario. Um, but, again, with the layout of the site and what kind of is best suited here with keeping the drive through to the rear and having the tanks kind of in the front there it allows us to have the truck pull in and while it is fueling it would kind of be sitting in that front aisle and also kind of out of the way of the rest of the site so the rest of the site could operate even if the truck is fueling there so that position to get it ultimately in that spot is is the reason and yes i mean it is you know a full maneuver around the canopy to to get it in that spot but <coughs> well, how does the car traffic work with the fuel island which way are the cars going they're going north south correct so that truck will block all three of your fuel it would be the truck would sit you know in this area and if if a car was in here like at that moment you know it would have to it would probably be restricted to coming and turning right out this way it wouldn't you know, the truck would kind of be sitting in, in this lane. Um, yeah. oh, sir. Could we follow up on that? I thought that it was not good practice, at least, for when your truck will be up filling up the tanks, which are right on top of the fuel island, for anybody actually to be operating one of your, you know, a car operating the pumps, because I always thought that you weren't allowed to have pumps working filling cars when you've got a tanker dropping fuel well again they, it would be off peak hours so they they would likely not be being used you know at that moment that's I mean, when they try when to I've schedule seen them in many filling stations when they are dropping there's they put signs up don't you can't use the pumps and in addition to which when yeah. your truck is in, i the haven't had that experience i've used the pumps at this uh mobile station here while they're filling it Oh. I've used the ones at Cumberland Farms. Oh, well, so. maybe I'm thinking of the regulations at elsewhere in the world. Um, the other thing is, I think, when your truck yeah, is actually there, people trying to come in from Continental Boulevard are going to have a pretty tight job to avoid taking out the front of the truck. But anyway, do you think it's going to work? We have to take your advice. You're the experts. Well, I'm, we can also have it peer-reviewed and offer our own opinion. We don't have yeah. to necessarily accept yeah. it. But anyway, um, I... I I thank you for the explanations that you've offered with this and the idea that the computer program may require a little bit more space than is actually required on the ground. And um, I don't know if this 43-foot uh, truck is the uh, accurate estimate of the size that the fuel truck actually is. Um, I, I'm not necessarily fully satisfied about the way the traffic is going to work on the site while you're fueling. Um, and I don't know what you can do about it, but um, ultimately it may just have to be a limitation on the site that we learn to live with. But um, it seems that it's going to be. And it, so, how often do you I have can, to fill up the tanks? I, what we can do is we can add some information to the truck circulation plan that identifies, you know, distances and dimensions <clears throat> and potentially show um, passenger vehicles, you know on the site in certain positions that mm -hmm. might give the board some comfort as to clearances yeah. and, and circulation that might exist. So the canopy is going to be tall enough that the truck can get under it if it has to because it's going to cut corners on the Correct. thing. Um, what is the, the um, landscape island by Continental Boulevard? It seems to be mostly grass, but um, is it got a curb on it or something? If that truck is turning its turn too wide, is it going to damage the landscaping that's there? Or is there something that deals with how that's going to play out? So we could look at shifting the landscape a little bit back if, you know, we want to offer some protection there. Well, I like so the landscaping not... better than the truck. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, you know, I, I'm not saying get rid of it. I'm just saying shift it maybe just off the curb a little bit so that if the tire of the of the truck does traverse it it won't also damage the landscaping um is it actually a raised curb to the landscape or is it level right off the pavement grass starts raised curb 
Okay, so, I mean, a truck can certainly go over a curb, but it's not going to be unnoticed by the truck driver as he does it. Correct. So, thank you for that. Um, I saw that you're, I, I like that you have the bat bypass lane and that you have the stacking lanes for the drive through What's the nature of the business that you think might be in the drive through Still to be determined, um, PMG may work different tenant deals, you know, who the convenience store tenant might be and who the drive through you know, co-tenant co might be is still, I think, to be determined. Um, we can give you some information, but you know, with real estate deals and things like that, it may not um, yeah. um, be final. I know that you can't, you won't necessarily know a tenant this far in advance, um, and uh, it, it can certainly change over time. Um, the observation that I would have is that we've got one other in town with a drive through that never was put into operation um, all the way on the north part of DW Highway. Um, and I've also seen those kind of around other towns where someone had the ambition to put it in there, but it never quite came together. I think the Zebra Express right across from you has a drive through component that's never been actuated. And I wouldn't pr uh, propose to tell an applicant how to do their business, but if you decided that you didn't need the drive through well, you got lots of room on your site to even have a bigger store and more shelves and more inventory and all sorts of things. Um, that are sacrificed in order to make the drive through work, um, if there's any consideration about whether there could actually be a viable tenant, I don't know. It's a thought to consider. Um, but uh, actually, you, now that I think of it, the Zebra Express right across the street has a drive through that's never, ever been used. Um, and obviously, some people are better at finding tenants than others, and it doesn't mean that it can't be, but... Um, it's a lot of site modifications built around something that, and, and money spent, space used, for something that if you're not really confident or you don't have it <laughs> locked down already, maybe think of it differently. Um, do other members of the board have comments or questions? I think I'd actually amplify your comment, last comment, Mr. Jim, by saying there is another filling station further down on DW Highway, just below, below the, um, our, our polluting neighbor and they that was scheduled to have a drive-through and it never even got created either which one's that the mm -hmm. south of St. Cobain yeah beyond St. Cobain there's a there's a filling station down there that has been through this board for a drive-through and they mm -hmm. never actually oh you mean north of St. Cobain that's what I was thinking north yeah, of St. Cobain of I yeah. think it's the same one. I think you're referring to the same Yeah, the one. rapid refill station that's up there almost before you get yeah, out of town. One, yeah. Last one on the way out of town. Yeah, that's um, the one. It's the same one. Okay. And frankly, there may be others. I don't know. Um, anyway, it's, it's obviously your choice to design your building the way you think that it should. But your site yeah, parameter has certainly become a lot more um, uh, open and flexible if you didn't have the drive through Bill? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. How big is this? What's the square footage of the current building today? Uh, the current convenience store is about 1,800 square feet. So you're doubling mm -hmm. the store? Correct. Okay. okay. Other comments or questions? Um, well, I had a couple questions, sort of. A lot of things are pending here and hanging, so uh, I didn't want to get into the weeds if we don't need to but um, I wasn't able to identify what those trees were that you showed you show in your picture and in one of your uh, landscaping plans you showed some trees but you didn't identify what they were they looked like they were bigger than ordinary trees but um, let's take a look at that while you're looking for that bill your comment about the size of the store having done some work for some other gas station developers uh, over the years um, that size of 3,500 to 4,000 is kind of the new normal for. I, I, I understand that, Mr. Chairman, but just because that's the norm doesn't mean I have to like it or accept it. <laughs> no, I agree. I like a nice big store, but yeah, I get. I'm just saying that you know, the, the, that y you make a very good point regarding the drive-through. That if there's no drive-through, then they have plenty of room to be able to get the tanker in and out on that particular site. With, with with minimal with minimal problems as as it is presented right now 
with the with the prospect of a drive through going through there at at an intersection that I think we all could agree as a board is a, is a pretty I'm not going to say heavily traveled but significantly traveled intersection where we've worked with the state regarding the, the signalization at that particular location it just <clears throat> which and we're going to continue to work have have issues as they work out the kinks on the new signalization as it relates to executive park drive that you're creating a situation that's going to tax that intersection potentially even more than what it is right now and that's that's how i'm looking at the site which is why i asked the question about the the current size of the store because if they were to change the configuration and just moderately expanded the store i don't think we would be having this conversation right now about the the radiuses the turning radius excuse me for yeah I, the tanker truck to get in and get out i agree with you that's what that's sort of the point is the tanker truck would have some more room if without the drive through um the drive through does sort of bring a lot of traffic to the site if it's um you know a coffee and donuts kind of thing and Although even beyond the 10 stacking cars that they've designed, there's a, still a lot of room left on the site. There are some Dunkin' Donuts around, um, like the one in Bedford right on uh, DW Highway uh, by Lowe's and um, whatever the restaurant is or the mini Coffee dealership door. is. Yeah. That one, um, cars stack out into the road onto Back River Road from that one um, for Dunkin' Donuts. Now, doubt you'll be Dunkin' Donuts since there's one 300 feet that way and 600 feet that way <laughs> from that site. <laughs> doesn't stop. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. <laughs> doesn't. Um, no, well, yeah, it's true. Um, thank you for the comment, Bill. Other comments or questions? And did you find the, the landscape question? Yeah, so on our landscape plan sheet six, we she do, does say, yeah. does say. We do have the, the trees kind of, they're just shown as circular symbols on six here. Of, yeah. Six of 12. But yes, I there are I we do have a plant schedule on the bottom right hand side of the plan uh -huh. and it does say that those would be seven uh honey locust shade trees okay i didn't okay honey locust huh okay oh yeah the shade master honey locust i see it now it's very fine print. Yeah. I can get That's that why bigger I've got for this you. Though, so I can read. I can get myself one of those. I tell you. <laughs> okay. Do so you happen to know some characteristics of that tree? What is, what's its grown height? And um, it, it does say somewhat. Yes, it does, Mister. It says size. That's three gallon. That's the plant that's size. That's the. So that's a three inch caliper. That's the size that it oh, would be installed. That's like the the trunk of the tree that it would be installed, but I can get you the installed and kind of like full growth heights. Yeah. Um, I can get that information for okay. you. I like what you've tried to do. Um, you know, you, you made an attempt to landscape this area, and I know there's some issues with the uh, waiver requests that we need to talk about separately, but I'd like our engineers to review those. But um, Okay. Um, I'm satisfied with that yeah. uh, answer thank you for now i like that you've got uh reducing the um entrance driveways on camp sergeant from two to one um i think that that organizes the traffic yeah. a little be better and it also yeah. separates your exiting traffic from the entering traffic of the shopping center a little bit more and that's nice i think mm -hmm. that works out well other comments or questions about the project yeah. neil <coughs> yeah it's sorry. just I was just curious. What, um, I'm having a hard time locating where you may um, put like um, snow removal. Like where you, where you <coughs> pile in all the snow. Yeah, that was one of the questions we have to address. That so we'll have to look at the site plan and see like where you know we can put that. My initial instinct would be to um, potentially shift some of the trees the two trees we have in the rear maybe a little bit and create an area in the back next to the dumpster that we might be able to like push the snow that way they can kind of just plow it all to the back there um but i'll have to look a little bit closer and see what what makes what makes the most sense i'm not sure that that little spot would be enough storage space for a lot that size but you may be trucking it off site yeah there might there's there's a couple areas that i think I can designate, but again, I have to look at it a little bit closer with logistics of how, like, you know, the plow being able to move, you know, the snow in these certain areas. So, do you know how the site works today where they're pushing their snow? 
I don't. It looks like, based on the existing conditions, I mean, we can talk to the operator and get you that information. Um, There's kind the, of some dead space where they always do the they, kids' I car think wash. They push kind of in the south. Towards the, where the um, credit union is that side. That's yeah, that south area. That's where they, I think they shove it. If the you hurry up there, area. you might still find some. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> much snow left there these yeah. days. Um, yeah, I certainly would want to know how, what your plan is on that, and and you probably are already familiar with the limitations that you can't park it in places that you've decided is, is your traffic movement areas and parking spaces and all of that. Um, can't kill landscaping with it, um, that sort of thing. Can't push it into the road. Um, I think the little bit of landscaping that's along Continental Boulevard is probably too narrow to effectively be able to pile anything there without putting it on sidewalk and then into the road. So you'd probably have a limitation. So that is sidewalk along Continental Boulevard and turning up Camp Sergeant Road and then continuing south from there uh, into the bank's lot and into the shopping center. Is yeah. that correct? That's all existing? Uh, it would be, we are proposing, I think that was one of the comments at the conceptual meeting was to kind of like provide the crosswalk across the driveway entrances yeah. and kind of continue it on. So we did try to show that. Yeah. Did you, I, I see the crosswalk at the Camp Sergeant entrance. Did you do a crosswalk on the Continental Boulevard? We, um, we can add that. Um, you know, it's, yeah. it's just a matter of, of striping, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think I see it on sheet it's three on of sheet 12. Three of 12. It's called yeah, it's not it, on that one up there. It may have just not been it's not on colorized on this version. Yeah. Three of 12 shows yeah. crosswalk. No worries. Yeah. Thank you for that. Are there specific questions that you wanted us to be able to address for you here tonight in a, kind of a preliminary discussion um, kind of a thing before we, because I think we're going to table the question of completeness. Sure. I, I, the only real question I would have is, aside from reviewing the comments that we just got and responding to those, is there anything that this board would deem of critical importance to deem it complete? Um, and, ac and accept the application. It seems like the limitations that keep us from having that discussion about completeness are all technical um, aspects of the drawing that the engineers are in, in the uh, Department of Public Works is picking up on. So there's, um, I, I don't have anything to add to their information. Um, again, as I started with the introduction and I might have mentioned when we did the conceptual, I love the fact that the site's being redone. Um, it's a great upgrade. I like shifting the build, the rotating the site 90 degrees and making it oriented towards Continental Boulevard. I think that's where your traffic comes from. Um, and I think it'll actually be visually um, uh, better to look at from that direction when you do the building. I like the New England architecture style that you have on the building itself. I hope the canopy doesn't conflict or contrast with that too, too much. Um, other than that, I'd be picking on little things. I mean, I'd love it if you could fit a tree in the island by Continental Boulevard, but you probably can't. Um, okay. Um, Nelson, you had a comment? I'm sorry. Well, yeah, just the, uh, I would like a review of the lighting, and I guess Bob wasn't sure if, uh, if Fuss and O'Neill had looked at that, but this lighting plan, these requests for waiver. Yeah, so, oh, that's, that's true. Right. We haven't discussed Real that quick in skimming their comments before I handed them over, I saw that they, all they did was note that a waiver had been requested. They did not go into detail one way or the other how they felt about it, any recommendations. They don't do that. They just note a waiver had been requested. I would like their comments on the proposed waiver and what it, what it means on the ground. Okay. And uh, I had one other question. It, I, I know that it doesn't probably meet the, uh, the petroleum marketing group's uh, thoughts, but was any thought given to electric charging uh, vehicles? Uh, this is a new thing that's popping up here and there. And I, any thought or? <laughs> well, we'll, we will uh, automatically rough in two of the parking stalls for EVs. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I didn't okay. hear you. I'm gonna need Let me get you close to the, the microphone and, the mic and an introduction. Yeah. My name is Gary Kilfeather. I'm construction manager with Petroleum Marketing Group. We will um, rough in for two of the park installs for EV stations. The hard part right now that we're finding is trying to get um, with, with small counts some of the manufacturers to uh, work with us. 
Um, as an example, Tesla, we work with them on some of our airport travel plazas. Um, we have one in Chicago with over 20 stalls for EV. Um, but they won't even come and look at one unless they can have uh, six EV stations and parking stalls just for themselves with a potential of two more if you heat, if you, if they have certain volume limits. Some of the other ones um, in the past have worked off of a uh, subscription type of methodology and uh, it was kind of a loss leader hoping that they would get the subscriptions but the actual showing the units so long story short, that technology is changing real fast. Now, some of the gas companies are starting to get involved with it. So we're trying to work with them. Um, there's another company, Electrify America, that we're trying to work with. So we'll rough in for probably um, in either these two, yeah, probably over here, something like that, and then see if we can get one of them to work with us. Thank you. you. You're giving it some thought. That's what it was. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we're doing that. Uh, we're doing that standard on all of our rebuilds and new. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you for that. Tell me a little bit about the waiver requests and the arguments behind those. Sure. So we did submit um, the application for waivers, kind of like described it. So I'm, I'm going to use that as the basis for what I just explained here. But. Yeah. Um, the first one deals with parking lot mitigation. I believe it's section um, 11L, 3.11.L. Um, specifically, 1I, which requires 10% of the overall interior of the parking lot uh, to be dedicated to landscape areas. So, due to the definition of parking lot as being limited to the area in front of the convenience store, um, we really only have those two landscape islands on the end, and that really makes up about 5% of the parking lot, um, you know, per the perimeter. Um, if you were to kind of look at a broader sense, um, you know, and kind of expanded the area to include from the front of the convenience store almost out to the, <coughs> the property at Continental Boulevard, we would be closer to like 16%, and then, you know, a full percentage of the site is about 20 percent but because we are limited to that area and the convenience store itself itself people want to be able to park and just go right into the front of the store there isn't a lot of room to add extra uh, landscaping um, in that in that front you know perimeter for the for the 10 spots that we have there so we do have about five percent um, in the two islands on the end um, <clears throat> the second one is uh, 3.11.L5, um, uh, which states that shade trees shall be provided around the perimeter of all parking areas at a minimum ratio of one tree per uh, 20 feet of parking lot perimeter. So that would require seven shade trees to be place, placed around, you know, the perimeter of the parking area. Um, again, with that parking area kind of being just in front, we do only have the two trees in those, those landscape islands. We are providing additional five trees around the perimeter of the site to get to the total number of seven, but they aren't located right around that, that parking area. Uh, the third one is um, 3.11.L.3 that requires shade trees to be set back at least five feet from the curb. So those islands on the end, in order to provide you know, enough room for the vehicles to exit from the site, um, at the drive-through and then also provide the um, adequate bypass lane and stacking room on the other side and 10 spaces on the front you know all the spacing those islands are about nine foot wide give or take and so if you place the tree in the center it would be about four feet from the curb not five feet so we're really like a foot shy there um, from being able to keep that tree five feet from the from the curb it's it's four feet it is it's more than five feet from the drive aisle uh itself that runs you know along perpendicular to the spaces but from the spaces it's only about four feet um <clears throat> the other ones deal with the uh gas station lighting um so these ones are found in section 313 um e32 
uh, provides that the maximum illumination level at the property lines uh, should be no more than 0.2 foot candles um, except at driveway entrances. Um, so um, the lighting plan on sheet seven obviously is uh, it kind of spells out our foot candles um, at the ground level. Um, that northern sidewalk along Continental Boulevard is close to the property line, which is right next to that drive aisle and then the canopy. And those canopy lights are usually a little bit brighter, and I'll, I'll get into that in a second. But really, that sidewalk kind of has <clears throat> um, one spot that registers at 0.6 foot candles, where the minimum is, is, uh, is 0.2 there. So that's really a a function of the canopy light kind of being or the canopy's location in proximity to that that property line um, more for the safety of the pedestrians and and the vehicles you know in that area um, <clears throat> the other one similar it all kind of stems from this one kind of stems from the same same issue but um, within 313 f2 states that the uniformity ratio of lighting around the pump islands um, and under the canopy shall, mean, shall be no more than four to one. Um, <clears throat> so the site plan proposes about a 7.5% increase over that ratio under the canopy. Um, that is because typically the gas station canopies are gonna be higher illumination levels than um, other types of retail or, excuse me, commercial sites because they are uh, point of sale transactions. You have people taking out their credit cards at the pumps, etc. Um, people leave keys in their cars, right? You know, at the pump. So it's more of a safety precaution than anything to have the areas well lit. Not and considering people are using their cards, etc. At the pump, it's similar to like an ATM, which has higher required um, lighting levels. You know, by the state for like certain banks and things like that too. Um, and then lastly, um, within section 313E33 calls for a maximum uniformity ratio of lighting in a parking lot to be four to one as well. Um, this is more a function of just lighting in general. The proposed lighting plan calls for an average value um, in the parking lot of about 2.8 foot candles. Um, that's excluding the canopy area. but the lowest value goes down to 0.3 foot candles because we're trying to be sensitive of that 0.2 at the property lines where we can. And so when you go from 0.3 to as a minimum to the average of 2.8, that uniformity ratio is 9.3 as opposed to as opposed to four. So um, it kind of is a function of the significant figures in the decimal, right? Because like 0.3 to 2.8 not a huge difference, but when you're doing a ratio, it, it's higher than, than the four to one that's, that's required. But again, those elevated levels are for safety purposes, you know, considering all the parking is right in front of the store and we have the, the wider drive aisles. So some of those, some of those fixtures that might be um, spaced out do need to be higher intensity to be able to cover more, cover more ground. So those areas that are directly underneath or higher, which kind of raise the overall overall average. You're counting the, the drives and all as part of the parking lot, is that right? Is that what I understand? Correct. Yeah. Kind of when I say parking lot in, in yeah. this respect, I'm basically talking about the pavement area, the paved area. exclusive yeah. of, the, of what's under the canopy because that, you know, is in that, that other waiver requirement. So we yeah. calculated that separately. Okay, so thank you for the parking, the what is or is not parking a lot kind of also uh, is a part of your waiver request on landscaping. And so just in, in quick terms, point to what you're considering parking a lot for the landscape and if, if it's the same or not the same for the lighting. So for landscaping, because they talk about the parking area. Can you grab that mobile micro? Where is our mobile microphone these days? I didn't put it out. I'm good at out. No. There you go, that'll work. <laughs> it's not too far. <clears throat> so when we did the 5% calculation for the parking area, we were kind of mm. tracking this spot here. 
when okay. I gave you that number of like 16%, I was kind of looking at from the front of the building, kind of striking a line here out to Continental Boulevard. Right. So when you get to that 16%, it, it includes this area, but that doesn't really, that's not really the parking area, uh, I don't think. But in terms of lighting for safety purposes, parking area was pretty much, you know, the paved areas around the site, not what's under the canopy though. Okay, I understand. Um, I think uh, the landscape view of parking may be a little more conservative than you have to be. Um, I know that the pump area isn't actually considered parking spaces, although I have seen in some towns where they count those as parking spaces when they're figuring out whether they amount to the number of parking spaces that you need on the site. And if they're parking spaces, then they're parking area and the landscape in that would accrue to your benefit. Um, I, I'm wondering whether our regulations could be interpreted to have two different definitions of parking area. I think it, it, it is what it is for both purposes. Um, so whatever we think that it ought to be or how, whatever the correct way to analyze what the parking lot is should be the same. Yeah. Now, I think to Nelson's point, Putting, ho holding it to some impossible to meet restrictions on lighting where we want the driveways to be light lit but not right at the edge and but two inches away is a driveway uh, you know that's unrealistic of us to put you the expectation obviously those kinds of waivers either shouldn't be necessary or if they are, are necessary they're easily granted generally speaking every single one of your waivers relate to being a very crowded site Correct. and if you had more space you wouldn't necessarily need some of some or perhaps even all of the waivers um, I don't know if that necessarily is a tipping point for a decision on granting the waivers or not but I offer it up for your consideration that um, the, the amount of activity that's going on with everything on the site is what makes it hard to have more landscaping space and more distance from the canopy and the sidewalk and some snow storage and you know some of the other things that we're talking about here uh, mm -hmm. Comments or questions about waivers? <coughs> um, in terms of whether we, I, whether I personally would support those waivers, um, I wouldn't rule them out. I wouldn't sort of say carte blanche. I couldn't support any of them. I have to get comfortable with the idea of what you've got on the site and that you've done your best to try to accompl accomplish all of those things. That's me personally. I'm only one vote of. Ideally seven, but today five. Um, does anyone else have comments or questions about the general application? I know that we haven't even accepted it, and we're not going to. Just, and there's just, nobody else in the room to to do public comment. But just I'll ask a question to either you or to Mr. Price. And I apologize for my tardiness, Mr. Chairman. But did we ask for any type of a traffic study to be done at this location? Yes, and one was provided. And it was peer reviewed by Fawcett O'Neill. Okay, can you email me that, please? Yep, we got the comments. Uh, you, yeah, you missed this part. We got comments late this afternoon from Fawcett O'Neill on this plan, so I haven't gone through them myself okay. yet. And they just got them at the meeting here tonight. Okay, fair so enough. I'll get that to you. Okay, thank you. Yep. I guess that's. You know, I I just I hark I harken back to all the work that this community has has done, not just us. Council zoning board the, the issues that we've dealt with this with this intersection now I mean Nelson's been on this board for a long time and how many times have we have you had to deal with this particular intersection long same time. with you Alistair long so yeah I mean the, the way that I'm looking at it first and foremost is is not so much the density of the site but you know what's what's the what's the traffic impact going to be on the on the location I guess that's how I'm looking at it first and foremost and then the my second thought, and, I, and you alluded to it, Mr. Chairman, is the, the tanker truck. I mean, that's just, I, I, I'm having a very hard time wrapping my head around how a 43-foot semi tractor trailer with, with tank is going to negotiate that particular location. Um, and I don't know if it's for us to ask for some type of independent review or peer review, but I really would like, if it's at all possible, Mr. Chairman, to have a second set of eyes confirm what the applicant is seeking to do, that, that, that they 
would be comfortable with what the applicant is seeking to do because sure. you know, I'm not I'm not an engineer, Mr. Chairman. I'm not a land surveyor. I'm just you know I'm just I'm just like you said. I'm just one of five. <coughs> I, I'd like to see. Yeah, I agree. My understanding is that the truck moving patterns would be a part of the normal peer review process, okay. and if they they would make comments on them if they thought comments were necessary. Yeah. But it is also normal for us uh, on occasion when we think the time is right to call attention to a particular factor. Um, for the peer reviewers to specifically offer some comment on it and see, um, but yeah, that's where that's where our expertise lies is with our peer review and engineers. To be candid with you, Mr. Chairman, the, 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 they they would remedy this situation a little bit better if they would consider diminishing the square footage of the store. And I I appreciate the comments that you made that this is the norm, but site flow could be dramatically improved. If consideration was given to a different type of schematic for the store that would allow them to have the type of flow that I feel is necessary for the site. One person, one person making that comment, just me. Yeah. Um, I, there, there may be solutions that they can come up with for how right. to, uh, to uh, tweak things here and there. Um, I'm not sure how much benefit you get out of the size of the store versus some other choices they may might make, but um, our approach as a board is to uh, not try to take over and dictate to an applicant how they design their site. I, mean, I, I, yeah. I agree with your point, Mr. Chairman. Let's judge the one that they provided for us. Um, but I think Mr. Boyd's comment is uh, apt with regard to asking Fuss and O'Neill to pay some special attention to this truck entrance and, and because it is really, yep. it's really touch and go. It's, it's touch and it's touching the curbs everywhere it goes, the inside, and then when they go out to back out onto Connell Boulevard, they take up both lanes. It's yeah, it's a tight, tight turn. It is a tight turn, and maybe the 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 model that you use for the tanker truck on the plan is bigger than the actual tanker trucks are these days. Probably not, but maybe no. they're getting bigger. They're getting smaller. bigger. They're not getting smaller, Mr. Yeah. Chairman. Um, oh, you never know. Anyway, um, give me a rundown quickly. Um, Mr. Coakley of the drainage uh, uh, design for this site and how that's going to work? So generally the site drains from kind of the southwest corner towards the northeast corner. There's some drainage structures at the intersection there and then from there it seems to go down to the east you know on Continental Boulevard. So we're looking to mimic that grading pattern with our proposed grading plan. Um, capturing you know runoff in some catch basins on the site treating them for water quality and then putting them in an underground like detention basin before you know connecting at the same kind of um manhole that's that's you know on the site and then discharges out okay i'm sure you'll have some um effort working with our public works department to satisfy their um thoughts and and concerns with respect to adding water into the um, street drains and knowing that that's not going to cause the town any other headaches which certainly have plenty of with respect to stormwater these days. Is the applicant aware that we're an MS4 community? Yes. Thank you. Other comments? Okay. Um, it probably seems silly to uh, have a uh, to open it up for public comment when there's no public in the room and we haven't accepted it but just for the sake of doing so are there any members of the public who wish to have comment? Seeing none, we'll close that. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to. Um, is there any other business that you need us to kind of detail? Or, so you guys are ready to um, take a look at fixing up all of the details and all the comments and then coming back before us? Sure. So I guess just procedurally, how would that work? Because I know the original memo said, you know, recommended continuation to April 21st. Um, we do also need to go to the Conservation Commission. So... Is that something to to pass there? Should we go to conservation commission before yep. all so of this, or our, should we deal with this and come back and then? Yeah, our board has approached that in either uh, option for you, um, doing the conservation commission first or second. It's a little bit better for us to do it to to go to the conservation commission first, so we've got their information and we can consider it as we do that. Um, it, it hardly ever happens, but um, the headache if you do it the other way around is 
we grant conditional final approval subject to whatever the Conservation Commission comes up with, and then no matter what they come up with, you're stuck with it. Mm -hmm. um, and they're usually pretty reasonable, but once in a while you might have something they want that you think ought, ought to be reconsidered or done, and we can't do that if we've approved it first, then you've got to come back to us to ask for an amendment. It gets a little complicated. Hardly ever happens. Our Conservation Commission is pretty reasonable. Um, you know, they tell you, you know, not to use salt, not, not to use hay, um, not to, to use native plantings. I mean, it, kind of very familiar concepts that we get from these. Um, but if you do a Conservation Commission first, you don't run into that issue and you've got that. We can look at whatever they recommended, if anything, um, and then deal with it. Um, if you do it the other way around, which you know we've done, we've done with variances where you go get your variances after you do planning board approval, but you can end up boxing yourself in pretty badly by getting an approval that takes uh, account of whatever a different board is going to come up with, it gives them a little more authority than maybe you want. Um, but if you can accomplish that by April, that's fine. If you think you need more time, tell us you need more time. Um, we should pick a date today because otherwise you have to do new public notice to so all the abutters if we don't have a certain date that we decide on here. I, I think we're okay with that April 21st date. Um, the one question I had with that is how far in advance do you need, you know, revised plans? Right, and that's part of the reason I chose the 21st as a recommended date because we need things about three weeks in advance, okay. just like the normal submittal schedule. That way we can send them back out so other departments can check over uh, comments. I know you've only just received public works so far. I anticipate we'll get other comments from other departments uh, slowly but surely, and we'll forward those to you as we get them. But knowing that they have revised plans as well, um, they may wait to see those. Uh, so that in theory for the 21st meeting we'd be looking for something around the end of March so that gives you about a month to get all this stuff uh, put together and then we take them and we send them out internally to try to get you some comments in advance of the next meeting okay sounds good so if you're heading for that April meeting you got most of March to get your stuff together and get it submitted get to the Conservation Commission actually sometimes they the Conservation Commission meets the day before our meeting and the chair of the Conservation Commission is very diligent about getting his report um, through email and very often I'll sit here on Tuesday with their report from the night before. Okay. Um, so they're pretty good about that. Um, pretty flexible. Okay. Are there other boards or commissions that you've got to see for this? I don't think that there are any. I don't think so, no. Okay. The only other thing they needed was zoning relief and that's already been granted, so. Okay, what was the zoning relief that you needed? A uh, special exception for the uh, the gas station use because it's no longer outright permitted. It's a special exception use, and because they're tearing down to rebuild, it's a voluntary removal of their vested rights. So that's why. Well, I'm glad they didn't give you a bad time with the relief because they shouldn't. <laughs> you kind of deserve it. Um, I, I, again, I do compliment you on improving a site that's uh, got a lot of mileage on it so far. Um, it's been very popular with the local uh, high school fundraisers for every club in town <laughs> to do a car wash there. And I'm not sure it's the best car wash ever, but bless their hearts, they're trying. And <laughs> raise a couple of dollars. Right. It's better it's than a good cause. The, what's that? It's a good cause. It's a good cause, yeah. yeah. Um, sometimes it puts the kids standing in the median where I wouldn't want to see them, but yeah. they are anyway. It is what it is. Um, so, but I do compliment you on that. I don't think, ho hopefully none of the comments and the feedback you've gotten from us has discouraged you from, um, you know, the, the support that I think that there would be from a project like this. It'll be a great site to have a, a nice facelift on. Great. Uh, Particularly so. the, uh, the, the, the building looking much more like what we did with the uh, Burger King over the other side. We've made the buildings in that area all start to conform a bit. Absolutely. Okay. If there's nothing else that you need from us, thank you for coming in. Do we thank make you a all. motion for two yeah. Oh, we didn't pick a date. We didn't pick a date. We uh, did 21st. We didn't vote on it, though. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Second. Second. Uh, motion and second to continue um, both the acceptance and the uh, formal review of the application until April 21st. In this room at 7 p.m. with no notice, further notice to about this. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Five zero zero. We'll see you in about a month and a half. Thank you.
Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank, Thank you, you guys you. for coming Thank you in. Request to Robert. I would like copies of that material that Bill uh, requested as well. Thank the, you. The traffic? The traffic and the uh, peer review comments. Well, the peer review, we'd, I'd like to see it sooner than it, you send it up. The sooner we get it, the better, Robert. Can we? All right, that would be lovely. Excellent. Super. Let's see, I've got an agenda somewhere here. What did I do with it? I've got a spare one. Okay. Where's I one found it. Oh, didn't find it. Okay, item number four, four. on our agenda is yeah. John Stewart as the applicant and AMNI Merrimack LLC and Gloria Heath as the owners. Review for acceptance and consideration of a final approval for a lot line adjustment. The parcels are located at 21 and 25 Craftsman Lane in the R1 Residential by Soils District, Aqua Conservation District, and Wellhead Protection Area. Tax map 2A5 and 2A6, case number Planning Board 2020-7. Robert, is there anything that we need to know before we hear from the applicant? Oh, probably. What do you got? Oh, he's got a couple he's more. Got more than, yeah. Oh, he's got more. Oh, all right. Okay. We'll give Thank you very much. The chairman is. Uh, is there any introduction, Robert? Are we all set? Misplace my notes on this one. There sure. we go. Okay. Um, so I will say up front, as you probably noticed in your uh, packets, that staff did not complete review on this particular project, the lot line adjustment I'm speaking to, uh, because when Tim was reviewing it, he felt that the project should be recommended as incomplete. And the reason he felt that way was because this the first portion of this project is a lot land adjustment with the neighboring parcel to be able to get some additional land for the purpose of expanding the parking lot as a part of the site plan as a part of the lot land adjustment itself if the board looked at the plan it does not have the complete boundary information for both lots it focuses only on the area that's the subject of the specific transfer of land Tim took the hardline approach that the regulation would require complete boundary information for the entirety of both lots, so he ceased review at that point knowing that he did not have it. In speaking with the applicant's engineer about this, they have gone forward and submitted a waiver request, which you have in front of you, uh, date stamp February 26th. Uh, that does request a waiver, which I'm sure Mr. Burns will speak to. Um, that allows them to proceed or would allow them to proceed with only showing the boundary information that they have presented to you currently rather than presenting the entirety of both lots and they've got some reasons for that that they can get into um, the only thing that i want to add to that is that the regulation that's cited uh, is actually the wrong one that's the one that was cited as a preliminary uh, like a design review type section, it should actually be 4.06.1 uh, instead of 4.05b. But I, I can note that if the board decides to uh, grant the waiver, we can go into that process and I'll, I'll correct the numbering for you. Um, what was the number again, the correct one? It's The correct numbering is actually 4.06.1 subsections A, B, and C is what Great. it should be. Okay, thanks. So as, as I've noted, Tim is strongly opposed to it. However, the questioning that I had, um, and I talked to Dawn as well about this, giving her uh, licensed land surveyor background, as well as Tom checked in internally with his staff. Uh, if the board were to grant the waiver, the Registry of Deeds would in fact accept that plan and would record it. So it's not something that is unheard of mm -hmm. um, but it's completely up to the board whether they feel that it's appropriate in this case so uh, with that I'd like to turn it over 
Okay, it seems like the new plan we've just gotten may have some more information in it, but I'll wait for the applicant to tell us what's before us. All right, please introduce yourself and tell us about the project. Okay. Um, good evening, um, Mr. Chair, uh, gentlemen of the board. Uh, my name is Tom Burns. I'm a project manager with TF Moran. Uh, we are the engineering firm that is acting as the consultant for the applicant, uh, John Stewart and Bedford Martial Arts. Um, so as Robert explained, um, the first step in kind of this two-part process for this site, um, for this redevelopment, is uh, a proposed lot line adjustment that would transfer a little over 8,000 square feet from lot 2A-6 uh, 2A uh, to 2A-5. Uh, the intent of, of acquiring this additional piece of land is to provide on-site parking for the proposed use on the site. Um, and as submitted um, and as discussed, the, the lot line adjustment plan that was put together, uh, the, our surveyors, uh, between a combination of both research of available records um, going back to, eight, to the 1860s, as well as uh, on-the-ground survey work that was done uh, trying to close the boundary on the adjacent lot on lot 2A-6, the issue that they ran into, and I can, I can illustrate the location of kind of where the, the question is on the boundary. So this is the location of the proposed lot line adjustment. It's the section in here. It's a 50-foot wide swath that would be transferred to this lot, basically just squaring this off. And again, that would, for the intent, is to provide for the required parking on the site. The uh, entire existing parcel of uh, lot six is a little over six acres of land um, per the records that are on that we found at the registry um, as well as at the town for this the question that the surveyors had and the reason that they did they could not provide a stamped boundary for this entire parcel for this adjacent lot is um, relative to this lot line here on the west side of the parcel uh, again, going back to the 1860s and their research on it, there's, um, there are conflicting descriptions for outlining this line, both um, on the deeds that are on record for this parcel as well as the deeds that are on record for, for the adjacent parcel. So they diverge in terms of trying to close these boundaries. So one of the efforts the surveyors made was um, on the ground, they went out through the site. This is uh, a pretty dense swampland that's through here. Um, they, that they went through and tried to traverse. They could not find any monumentation existing on the ground in this area. The other issue they had was they tried to back into the boundary of this lot by trying to close this boundary, and there's a difference in it that basically when they're trying to plot these boundaries, the lines are diverging. Um, it, it looks like as the deeds went forward, uh, coming forward over the, the years from, from the 1800s to now, the deeds that are on record um, at some point, there was some kind of a change in the way the descriptions were done for those lots so that it created this divergence, hence why they couldn't close it. Can I ask a, maybe a too silly a question? Yep. Um, are these two lots in common ownership? No. 2A7 and 2A6? No, they're not. Okay. Is there a way to just do a lot line agreement or adjustment between those two parcels? So, so that, that was, it? yeah, and so that would, that would be one of the issues that was done. And again, there, you know, that would be something that's independent of the, the applicant Correct. doesn't own either of those lots. Um, so it would be something where they would have to approach the owner of lot seven to see if he's even amenable to a, lot, a boundary line agreement with the owner of lot six, if that's the case, to try to establish a boundary line between them. Um, and, and one of the things that, as the surveyor, again, he felt because of the fact that they were able to find all the monumentation on the property line some, um, in the area where we're doing our lot line adjustment, they were able to establish these boundaries along Hall Road, along Craftsman, um, along Lot 4 behind us, and along here to, to be able to establish the boundary on that side. Um, they weren't comfortable with the idea of burdening the applicant with having to go through and potentially engage them for it because they'd be looking at, uh, you know, whether they'd have to retain an attorney to get those parties to agree to create the boundary on that side. And that's why they, um, that's why we sought the waiver, just because of the, the hardship that it creates for the applicant, both, both in the time involved and the money involved and uh, 
Well, I understand that they're not in common ownership, whereas uh, five and six are in common ownership. But you're already drafting essentially the same documents. Five you're doing and, a lot line adjustment. Five and six are in, are in different ownership. E even better. Yeah. You've already got two parties that are drafting the exact same agreements except for the description of where the line is. And so you're not really adding a lot of work from a legal standpoint to have a second boundary line agreement that just changes the names of the parties, same language, different description of where the line goes. And you resolve it. I mean, if, as long as you can get the parties to come to an agreement on it, I would think that the owner of 2A7 has got some interest in knowing where his lot line is, too, um, and resolving this ambiguity in his deed. Um, mm. Anyway, um, I didn't mean to interrupt your. No. So, I, and, and, and again, understanding that that would, be, that would be the likely path based on discussions with the surveyor, and again, based on what was found for available research, that he. You know, he feels that that would end up being the outcome is that they would have to engage an attorney to, to put together some kind of a boundary line agreement. They'd have to make, get both parties to agree that, you know, it was a, an equitable solution for both parties for seven and lot seven and lot six, that they would have to agree that that's a boundary that they're satisfied with between the two of them. Um, and it puts the burden on the applicant to then, um, to, to then finance that exercise and then puts his project on hold if, mm. if in fact, it's possible. It's something that, in speaking with him, he said, depending upon the cost and the time that's involved because of his, the timeline on his purchase and sales, he said it may be something that he has to walk away from this project. Okay. So there were a number of factors that kind of that went into it, which was, <laughs> again, the rationale for the surveyor. And, and as Robert explained, uh, you know, the surveyors, he noted that the, this is a, for a boundary line adjustment like this. This is the type of plan that they've, you know, that they make, um, you know, fairly frequently that the registry records in this manner because of the fact that they're able with confidence to establish the boundary in the area where the uh, adjustments being made. And we know that um, lot six will still conform to all of the town's zoning requirements in terms of minimum lot size, frontage. It will, although anything that you record, whether you intend it or not, becomes somebody's reference plan for the next thing down the road. And just showing what you've handed out to us, somebody will look at that and say, oh, well, here's a plan that shows something. Let's see if I can use this for a reference plan. Um, that's why I don't really like the idea of having a, a, a lot that's being adjusted before us where we don't know all the boundaries on it. Um, I guess maybe I'll have to think about if I can get used to that idea or not. What yeah. do you guys think? <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a title examiner. I'm used to stuff like this. This is nothing. The uh, the adjustment that they're making, you know, they've got the southerly, easterly, and the northerly side that they, they can pinpoint. Mm -hmm. They probably looked at the taking of 101A at the state. They've got monumentation yes. along 101A that runs all the way from the Amherst Hollis town line up to the intersection at uh, at Boston Post. You know, they've, they've probably run... You know, done a couple of different tangents with their, you know, with their transit. You know, they've done done use lasers or plumb bob. What's that? We're using lasers or plumb bob with your uh, or plumb bob while you're out there. Uh, they would have been. They were running with the total station out total there. Total station out yeah. there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, from where I from where I sit, I mean that the, the the focus is on the easterly side of two A six. It's not the the north northwesterly side, Mr. Chairman. So I, I didn't see why we would lose sleep over it. My one man's yeah. perspective. Yep, yeah, I get it. Nelson, what's yeah, your thought? Yeah, well, I, I was originally um, going to go along with Tim on this, but uh, uh, I've heard a little more now, and I'm a little more uh, troubled by the fact that we can't seem to do this. It, it doesn't show it being wetland, but it, that's wetland in there as well. And that intersection bothers me, that intersection point, um, which is in the wetland, you know, mm -hmm. which is in the town of Amherst, mm -hmm. um, uh, I see some complicating factors here. Uh, one of the one of the other issues that they had found too was the original descriptions ran part of the course was running along the center line of the existing brook that runs through that that area 
trying to establish the line, and as the brook has you know likely shifted since the 1800s, mm -hmm. um, it you know further complicates trying to tie that line. I, I can't begin mm -hmm. to tell you how many plants I've seen of a piece of property that shows a brook one way, then a brook another way, yeah. and you've got you know 19 different depictions yeah. of what the brook likes looks like through through certain periods of time. Yeah. These people are going to have a hard time. The, the state must have gone through there and surveyed for the well, uh, 101. Mm -hmm. I, I, made that, I made that point, Nelson, that they... Well, that they yeah, when they, they... Given they're actually trying to widen the, the 101A at that point, they've probably done it, they did it a little more recently. They, they were, there were survey teams out there for, oh, about six weeks on both sides of the road because that's where, roughly, where the three-lane piece of... What a what a is going to start, rough just it, on the it's town. It's not going to start. Hmm? It's not going to start. <laughs> oh, that's, that that's gone that. to the wall. That's it? that's been changed. Now, oh, so. all right. Well, I'm out of date again. No, I'm, no, I'm, it, it was. We just we just got briefed. The council got briefed on it on Thursday. So. All right. Thank you. For well, either way, whatever the state was looking the at with 101. They did the work. They, 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 they did the, the work. work because they were yeah. going to do it. I agree. I, I agree with you, Alistair. I, I agree. I'm but the, te the, the state's needs to establish whatever um, surveying it needed for that road wouldn't solve these folks' problem with that line. Um, it wouldn't have even tried to tr fish out where that line is going to be because it wouldn't matter to them. Probably. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe, maybe, maybe you know, they maybe. must have known. I would have thought they'd known what the uh, southerly line, that southerly line where it says existing brook, I would have thought they did that. But yeah, I don't think that's the line that's at issue, though. Right. It's not the worst part of the line, no. Robert. Um, I'm sorry. Just got a text from Tim. He's watching the meeting at home. He wants me to mention or to remind the, the board that due to the lot being in the R1 zone, the presence of wetlands on the lot does come into play in terms of uh, lot size and contiguous upland requirements and things like that. So bear that in mind. Um, thank you for that. Well, so that, in essence, means that if there is ever a project on 2A6 um, to develop in whatever way or subdivided in whatever way, um, being uh, undetermined as to that last little bit of property line could cause some headaches there. And course, actually, also as a part of the lot line adjustment itself, therefore creates a new lot. So we need to make sure that that new lot that is the new 2A6 <coughs> complies with those requirements. And without the information being presented <coughs> to us and knowing that, we don't really have a way to know that information. Um, it may be that the applicant can provide that information for us in some way or another, but we'll have to think about that. Um, I do see what Tim's after, though, and that, that's um, Neil. You look like you were on the edge of putting a hand out or no. raising a comment. Um, so, in order for two A six to be a compliant lot, it's got upland requirements, and so knowing how much um, upland there is there. Um, is something that would necessarily have to be calculated. In that zone, what do they require for the upland? Is it R1, you said? Yeah, so it's 100,000 square feet. Okay. If they've got 6.2 acres with a third of it or a, even a half of it covered with wetlands. You still have enough for the minimum lot size. Yeah, although you're getting to where you're, three acres is 120,000 square feet, so you're plus minus 20%. I, I think that you're still probably safe, but it does get t tough to estimate those kinds of things, which is two why you'd want this. 2A7 is more at risk for being non-conforming. 2A7 uh, can't be conforming because it's one acre. It, right. It yeah. only has 40,000 square feet yeah. and half of it's... Yeah. Um, so 2A7 would be a non-buildable lot, except that it's um, grandfathered and there's a building already sitting there and all of that fun. As is 2A6, by the way, but... Maybe 2A6 gets subdivided at some point in the future and people want to change something and build something down next to 2A4 or something. How big is 2A4 and do we know its boundary and are we confident that it is where it says it is on this? Yes, plan? 2A4 we were able to locate they, the monumentation. They were actually able to locate it along um, both the monument monumentation along Hall Road. They were able to locate the common boundary between 4 and 5 as well as the boundary between 4 and 6. Those are actually lots lots four and six, uh, while not in the same ownership, they are in the same family. It's a brother and sister that own those two lots. So they actually had 
the monumentation was there. They were able to show our survey crews where those where those monuments were on there. And none of those give you a reference point to figure out where these other lines are? I mean, usually when you've got it, a couple of the boundaries of a property figured out, well, the last it, ones aren't that tough. It brings us around. We were able to, again, we were able to establish the boundary lines along Craftsman Lane, um, down Hall Road. They can reconstruct the boundary um, along the highway based on, based on highway plans and records for there. It's, and then when you come up, um, when you're coming up this line here, it gets a little tricky. And again, it was this line here. It was just a, there was a divergence in the descriptions for it. it. It appears, at least as my understanding from what the surveyor explained, was somewhere as, as the deed descriptions have been brought forward over the last two centuries, if you will, there was, he said at some point, somehow the language of it changed, that the description changed, and he doesn't know if it was an error that was made that the description changed, but it diverged the line from where it had historically been, and there's no reason why. And then he said the records for 2A7 put that line in a different location. So again, that becomes the issue between the owners of 7 and 6. If you have to do an agreement, if that line is off by, you know, he was saying, I think he said, if you put them out in the field and the surveyors are trying to tie into a point and run those lines, they're diverging by like 20 feet um, between the deed description. So he said, now you have to try to get an agreement between those owners that they say one or, one or the other agrees to who's getting wh which land and, um, you know, and whether they're willing to agree to that. And, you know, and again, that was, that was our concern given the fact that we're just working on the east side of the property. We're not impacting that west boundary, but, um, you know, to have to, to have to close that boundary and do that, that additional work puts that burden on the applicant to try to resolve a boundary issue between those two abutters. Is the boundary on Craftsman Lane between lots six and seven, is that point established? I think that's floating as well when they're trying to do it. It's that whole line coming up is kind of. Well, so I want to start there and work backwards. Right. Then. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's again where they've had the problem is it's just not, so, it's not lining up. So you don't know for sure where that point is. Right. So you don't really know how much frontage either of these lots have. For lot seven, I don't know the frontage on lot seven. Um, no, I know lot lot six. Four, we six, have an eight. idea of the frontage. Again, you know, we're up an approximate idea base, but it, you know, again, it depends on which line you hold. But it does meet the minimum frontage requirements after the lot line adjustment that we're proposing either way. Depending where that point is yeah. between six and seven. But what we did was we looked at so the. So the frontage requirements in the zone is 150 feet of lot frontage, and that lot would be left with 280 feet with our adjustment. So they've got 130 feet of, of play even after our proposed lot line adjustment in the minimum required frontages. So they're not going to have an issue with meeting frontage requirements. But, but that's based on assumption that you know where that other point is. Mm -hmm. Well, no, he's saying that if at, at 280, plus or minus 20 based on how far they think this would diverge means they've got somewhere between 260 and 300. Um, and either okay, way, they're... Okay, in the worst case, it could be 20 feet difference. Correct. I f well, make sure, but... Yeah, that's that's what they've been telling, you know, what they said when they sent the crew out there and they're trying to lay it out. That's what they're, you know, what they're swinging is... It's, again, they tried to lay it out based off of one deed description and based off of another, and there's just such a divergence between them that... And again, that's kind of the point where they said, you know, this is going beyond what they felt comfortable, you know, having the app, putting the applicant on the hook for trying to do this. So they, that was the recommendation of the survey crew was they said the, the licensed land surveyor was that, um, you know, it's not necessary to close this boundary for what, what they're proposing to do with this lot. That's why they wanted to prepare the plan in this manner with the waiver request. Except surely that even with your moving a lot line, Zone, lot two, two A dash five is still shy of the 0 0.92 acres that it's required to have, and you're only getting 0 0.72. Mm -hmm. It's going to be used. It's got relief to be commercial and not residential, so it doesn't need the two acres of upland for that one. But I think that surely that matters. That they still, even with taking this little chunk, they still not really reach the required. Lot size. No, not mm -hmm. for a residential lot, but they're a commercial lot with relief from the zoning board to, to oh, have this use. 
All right. Yeah, this allows them to meet some setback requirements and things. It meets most of it. It's really the lot size that's wrong. Other comments or questions? So uh, the question that's before the board, we haven't decided that the application is complete based on the recommendation from staff that without this boundary line, it can't be determined to be complete. Um, we can accept that recommendation from staff. We could decide that it is complete notwithstanding the missing information if we feel like there's enough information to go on. And then we would necessarily be also in the same uh, effort granting a waiver of the requirement to establish the lot lines on the second lot of the subdivision. Um, I am very sympathetic to the applicant's plight. At the same time, um, I rely on the staff to tell me that the application um, has the lot sizes and frontages and all that sorted out. And if the mm -hmm. staff tells me they can't do so, um, I'm having a hard time saying That's let's jump let's jump too. beyond yeah. that. Yeah. Um, I I don't go through these and and compare a regulation and say it's got 150 feet of frontage and that's what's required. That's what staff does for us. And if the staff says we can't because we don't have enough information, um, that's pretty persuasive to me. Um, and I, it doesn't. I, I'm one of five. That doesn't mean that I get to decide this question. But what do you guys think? Regrettably, Mr. Chairman, whilst I understand the problems the applicant's got, I have to say I concur with your views. I'm uh, very sympathetic to the applicant's um, situation and having to spend, you know, probably several thousand dollars uh, trying to resolve that question um, and have that done. Um, I've, I've been there. I've been there with with uh, applicants, and I've been wear the shoes on the other foot. Um, Neil, do you have any comments or questions? No, I just tend to uh, resonate what Mr. Boyd was saying about how the information that we need to make a decision on that corner of the lot or for the, for the line adjustment. Seems like we have the information for that, but I also, I also hear what staff is saying and how you need that you need it to be complete in order, well, not just for now, but <clears throat> for future uses, it would be nice to know what all that is. <clears throat> so ultimately, I think it's going to, I'm, I'm leaning towards the way you feel about it, uh, Mr. Chairman, that it's not, it's not enough information for us to make a, to make a decision or, or to consider it complete. Well, we've all offered our comments. Does someone want to uh, consider a motion um, to determine that, that the question would be to determine whether it's complete or a motion to determine Chairman, that it isn't complete? I make complete. a motion that we, we regrettably, with all, whilst we're understanding the problems, we feel this application is not complete and therefore we cannot uh, make an, a, any dis discussion on it. Um, before we take a second, Robert, is there any... Um, Procedural difference between voting that it's not complete or continuing it to decide that in a future date? Um, I think you might want to act on the waiver request first to formally take action on it. Um, just Can to we settle do that, that without issue. having ac accepted it as complete? Yeah, and that's the tough part. So I guess. <clears throat> I mean, I think the message to the applicant is pretty clear. If we decide that it's incomplete without that information, it's essentially, it's functionally the same as deciding that the waiver isn't acceptable to right. the board. I, I think at that point, if if the board's view is that the waiver is not <coughs> acceptable, we would request a continuance to go back and consult with the applicant to see whether the application moves forward beyond this point. Um, okay. And, and uh, so we would, you know, look to have a continuance to a date specific so that we can either, you know, either he he authorizes us to invest in trying to resolve this issue or he says you know no that's it and uh, I do know that he has a like I said a limited limited window left on his purchase and sale so that that may also be something that impacts that <coughs> on how long it would take to do this mr. chairman I would move that this be continued to April 21st 2020 
Okay, before I accept uh, that motion, I never got a second on Alistair's motion because I interrupted with a question. And so okay. would you withdraw that motion? Or yes, I withdraw that with pleasure. Withdraw that motion. Robert. Tim did say that the waiver can be acted on prior to acceptance because the waiver is the critical item that is required for the board to be able to accept the plan. Okay. Um, it seems that the applicant would like us to just continue the discussion of the acceptance and resolve that in the future. Um, but I think that you've heard the consensus of the board kind of on the, or, or would you like there to be a vote on the waiver itself? Um, well, I think the waiver is what we were trying to establish was whether the waiver would be would be acceptable so to allow staff to continue review. Um, it's, it's my understanding is without either the waiver being granted by the board or a complete boundary of, of the adjacent parcels being provided, staff can't do their review of the lot line adjustment and I assume then the site plan as well. And in the uh, staff notes, uh, Tim does lay out that if the board chooses not to grant the waiver, then the applicant could then uh, request a continuance to a later date to then either provide the necessary information or uh, come back with some other idea yeah. or to, to negotiate with their client. And this wouldn't you. tangle up your site plan, but it does by uh, default. So your site right. plan would establish right. the boundaries of this 2A5, and once the lot line was done, the rest of the, uh, that other boundary doesn't matter anymore, but you have to establish that to get to there. So. Correct. So I can't proceed with the site plan until mm -hmm. the boundary question for the lot line adjustment is is addressed, right? Is resolved. So that that holds up the site plan for it as well. So um, uh, understanding the board's scheduling, I know that there were earlier meetings. I'm not sure. Yeah. So there is a meeting March 17th, as we discussed, but there's no other business scheduled, or April 7th is another option instead of going all the way out to the 21st. I just picked April 21st because I wanted to give you ample time to have conversations to. Yeah. I'm in the minority, just to let you know. I no, well, I on this issue. I'm I in the minority <laughs> compared to my colleagues over here. I, but I all that being it. said, you know, I want to make sure that we're giving you ample time for your client to be able to have the necessary conversations to perambulate the location to establish that northwestern yep. part of 2A6. Um, and I know w there was another meeting. I know that this, there was a recommendation that staff had made. Right. So we were looking for April 7th as a part of ours because okay. of the fact that we were anticipating no business on March 17th. So April 7th or 21st are the choices. I, I, if April 7th is... Um, so is, is available, we would accept that. We would certainly appreciate Move that. Move to continue to April 7th, Mr. Chairman. I'll is there second. a second? I'll second. Is there a second? Boys now, motion. if we vote on this continuance now, that means that we're not voting on the waiver at all. Correct. We're just sort of right. going with Correct. what our understanding is, right. and we'll address a waiver w at our next meeting with a formal vote. Okay. Does that work for you? Yes. Okay. Um, if there's no further discussion, all in favor of continuing to April 7th, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? Five zero zero for that. Um, one more um, comment to offer up on this site, which I um, regret that I didn't think of before. But um, as we think of whether we would provide the applicants some re relief or some room, um, this is one of those sites that's um, been for a very, very long time out of compliance. And this, a this applicant's doing his doggone best to get it into compliance. And that's usually something that gets a little bit of courtesy from us and some some consideration on some things and so depending on how they uh, what, what they find out in the next few weeks if the applicant appears before us again in, in basically the same position um, maybe that can be a thought that we take uh, into our calculus on April 7th um, I think that we're generally try to be very generous and kind to folks that look at a site that's got some issues and trying to fix them Thank you Thank for you. that. Um, I wish we could provide a little bit more clear path for you. Uh, I just feel stuck without having the ability to, to draw on the staff well, to the be able to resolve these questions. The is get, get your waiters out and go and wander around with. <laughs> I don't think I'll find monuments there in the swamp be any better than there. there. I don't think you'll find There won't anything. be a monument there. No, I'm the sure thing, you're right. I would work off the frontage on Craftsman Lane if it were me. I would. Mm go out and try and find those monuments or replace them if they're not existent and make them tie in with the current owner's deed and see if you can work it back from here. I, mean, well, I think they up? probably could establish both lines ba based on the deed from six and the deed from seven or before the error in the 1800s and after the era. I mean, but then picking which one's right because you got 
perfectly good evidence on both sides of the equation. Right, and again, that was and that was the issue that that they ran into where the yeah. surveyor said, I, yeah. you know, I'm not going any further with trying to, yeah. you know, establish. He said because it's just going to create, you know, a huge headache with them, and then putting it on the applicant and everything. And so that's what that's that was the that was yeah. the intent for the waiver request. Was he said, you know, just to not burden him. Um, you know, the, the numbers yeah. he was turn, throwing out in terms of, you know, cost and time that was involved for this and having to get all parties agreeable to it, he's, you know. Yeah. These do, these little headaches are worth resolving um, for the benefit of lot six and seven. I mean, somebody will want a shed or a driveway or a barn or mm -hmm. uh, whatever, and somebody will say, no, that's too close to the line or that's on my side of the line, and you're off to the races for it. And, um, it's worth getting those things worked out while they're there, but when nobody's, you know, can't put in their swimming pool or their whatever because of it. Anyway, um, we'll see you in uh, six weeks. Seven. And then yeah. We need to request that. Yes. Four weeks. So, <laughs> yeah, That's why I'm not moving yet. Exactly. So along those lines, we anticipated that the site plan could not go forward in either case. Uh, so instead of having him write something since he was going to be here to present anyway, he's going to have him verbally request the continuance for the site plan so that way the board could act on that. Thank you for that. That is, let me just go ahead and uh, go through the agenda. That is item five on our agenda, which is the same applicant, John Stewart, as the applicant and AMNI, Merrimack Realty, LC as the owner, review for acceptance and consideration of a site plan for a professional, martial, professional office, martial arts studio, and after school program and associated site improvements. Parcels located at 25 Craftsman Lane in the R1 residential uh, by Soils, Aqua Conservation District and Wetlands Protection Area Tax Map 2A5, Case Planning Board 2020-8. Move to April 7th. Is there a second? Second. Yeah. Oh, sorry, yes, Mr. Chairman. Second. Motion and a second to continue to April 7th with no further notice to a butters. Um, knowing the issue with surveyor is, do you want them on the same day? Or do you think that the April 7th issue with surveying could be important to know before you get to the well they're going to tie but it's going to be tied together and i think if we can't resolve the boundary before then we'll you know we'll, we'll contact staff and um you know whether or not they they get continued again or have to be withdrawn they're going to run together these applications at this point so that makes sense um, i know that in the pairing that we have before us now we got materials for the lot line adjustment and no materials for the site plan because okay. they weren't one was depending on the other yeah, um, I, I mean, in this case, we've we've submitted the site plan materials already. The applications came in together in okay. the beginning of February. So the um, and because of the fact that the again the area that we're we're working in isn't impacted by this boundary, um, you know, it wouldn't affect the okay. the site plans. With that in mind, all in favor of continuing it? Aye. Aye. All right. Any opposed? Any abstaining? Five zero zero. So we'll Thank see you. you in about a month. Okay. Thank you Thank for you. your patience in working yes. through this. Thanks I know that it's not easy, um, and there's nothing more frustrating than digging into old real estate records and trying to figure out which spotted elm tree they mean is the boundary and which rock with a hole in it. That's why I have a job, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> yes, you do. That's true. Um, discussion and possible action regarding other items of concern. I have a memo in my stack here somewhere from our public works department looking for us to establish two uh, performance bonds. Um, these are related to level acres phase one and two, the road and infrastructure bond estimates. Uh, to summarize the memo, which I could read the whole thing if you'd like, but to summarize it, um, the recommendation of our deputy uh, director and town engineer, Don Tuamala, is that we establish a performance bond for Level Acres Phase 1, Kathy Street, Constant Street, and Brick Lane in the amount of $485,463.45, and that there also be a performance bond established for Level Acres Subdivision Phase 2, Reeds Ferry Way, and Level Street in the amount of $406,969.49. Move approval. Uh, motion second. to approve as read. Yes, second. Yes. Second. Any further discussion? I want a question here. Sure. Um, these roads are already built, are they not? Kind of. 
<laughs> Level Acres is the subdivision that was approved by the Board of Selectmen prior to the planning board existing back in the 1960s. That's my recollection. And yeah, it, yes. it is partially built. However, it is substantially complete, as you would say. Um, however, there's a large chunk of it that has not been built out that is off of those streets. There are several lots there that have been subdivided. They exist. Uh, however, they were not built out. So they the, weren't built out because of wetlands. Partially All that, partially steep water. slopes. So there's a variety of, there's, there's probably, uh, if I remember the count, there's somewhere in the neighborhood of 80 or 90 unbuilt lots out there. Uh, mm -hmm. Initial estimates were in the ballpark of 40 to 45 were actually viable. Um, so what happened is the uh, John Foster, the, his family, the estate that owned all that land, he passed away. The estate put it up for sale. Uh, there's an agreement, or I think it may have transferred at this point, to uh, Lamontang Builders. They are going through the process of doing the analysis and finding out what lots they can actually construct on. Uh, because, again, the subdivision was substantially completed. They have the authority to do that as long as they upgrade the roads on those lots that were not completed. There are several lots on Kathy and Constance that, with the existing portion of roads that are there, if that gets upgraded, those lots can be built out. Those trees have already been cut down. Some work has, has begun, but the road upgrading is reliant on this part to begin uh, so that's what these bonds are for so they could begin the actual phase of upgrading the road extending the utilities and then building out the uh, the house lots no further review by planning board no. uh, requested nope. required or it's not required the reason they stopped building was because it was all wet the I lots, mean, yes, the lots yeah. where Kathy comes all the way down yeah. and loops around and connects back up to Constance, mm -hmm. the lots mm -hmm. we're building are off of, off of that section. There's lots that are in the substantial wet area that's off of that, what's it's called Brick Lane, that, that loop portion between there and Reed's Ferry Way and Page Street and that other side. Uh, there's lots in there that are underwater and likely not viable. They're still investigating their options there. Um, but there's also some unbuilt lots off of Reed's Ferry Way uh, that are viable. They just were not constructed. And there's no further planning board review of any of this? Correct, because the development was already built out. All that analysis was done 10 years ago with the town's legal counsel. Um, it, it's, they've been granted vested rights. It's, it's all been established. Well, you've had one bite of it, else, and you can't have yeah, another one. Yeah, well, I want another bite. We, I thought we bit the head off it, but I guess not. <laughs> no, you guys approved a swampy subdivision. No, no you didn't pay attention. <laughs> that was even pre. Before the <laughs> selectman approved it, before there was a planning board. Mm, let's play back. Well, you're still yeah. responsible, whatever, whoever approved it, Nelson. We've got you. Yeah, you're a selectman back then anyway. Um, all right, so the motion and second is to approve these two bonds and the amounts identified in the memo from uh, Dawn. Yeah. Uh, if there's no further discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? Five zero zero to establish those uh, performance bonds. Um, are there any other discussion items that anyone would like to raise? Just uh, the point that I alluded to regarding the widening of 101A DOT <clears throat> came to town council last Thursday and presented a modified plan that was reluctantly approved by uh, TTAC at the uh, NRPC back on the, on the 19th. And part of it is objections were raised by connection for for a variety of different reasons: storm water, snow storage, crosswalks, um, impact to the to their particular site. Um, the council encouraged DOT to go back and have a conversation with con with connection because connection uh, apparently has an alternative plan that they would like to present to the DOT. Um, where the disconnect was, I honestly don't know. But I'm hopeful that there will be a conversation between DOT and Connect regarding whatever that alternative plan is. They feel that there is 
opportunity on the opposite side at the bottom of where Home Depot is located to <laughs> Your look is, is <laughs> there's a hell of a slope. I did it. Is, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Alistair, I, I this, this is don't shoot the messenger. Okay, this is they they think that they can remedy the situation by diverting things over to the particular soil that exists at the base of uh, of the Home Depot's property. So it's 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 their baby right now. But but, <clears throat> but coming back full circle, they've presented a modified plan. That will provide necessary improvements on Boston Post Road and Craftsman Lane, improves a little bit of the intersection at at Industrial and Continental. Um, just doesn't give us the complete three lanes going eastbound into Nashua, like uh, we were hoping but, to see. But it won't make any difference because if you look, the junction where um, where you've got the old TD Bank and you've got the uh, right aid, the other um, no, it's it's uh, the other pharmacy the other side that traffic light will negate anything you do if you look at the time that tra south of the traffic light controlling traffic going towards Nashua that traffic will you won't make any difference I'm just telling you the level of service right now is an F with the widening and without the widening with the improvements goes to an E so I I, I don't disagree with you I, I, I don't disagree with you. I'm just saying that's that's what that's the that's the new modified plan that's been presented in connection supposedly as something to offer. So we'll we'll see what happens with that. So yeah. let them um, let them try. Let them air their idea. And if Absolutely. it works, it works. If it doesn't work, then the DOT can decide right. what it's going to do. So another issue. And then the other thing, I don't know if uh, the board was made aware of it, but Stan Heinrich passed away. Who? I didn't know that. Stan yeah. Heinrich. Oh, he did. Oh. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I don't know. Uh, I know I was notified about it on. Recently? Uh, I think he passed away on either Saturday or Sunday. Oh. So I just. Um, hasn't been in the paper. Hasn't been in the paper. I'm sure they're still yeah. working things out. But, yeah. Uh, um, and I hope I'm not being premature to the Heinrich family by announcing this publicly. And I apologize if I am. But um, we all know Stan. Uh, yes. And, and the, the passion that he brought to this community for yeah. the, the the number of years that he's been active in the town of America, especially with uh, especially with the school district, and th there was no bigger advocate for the schools than Stan Heinrich, and it's uh, it's a sad day for our community yeah. you know, when you yeah. when you lose a regardless of I've had differences of opinion with Stan and like like all of us, but you can never uh, take away. The, uh, the love and the passion that he had for our community. So my thoughts are with Pat and, and, uh, and the Heinrich family tonight um, on Stan's passing. It's, um, it's a sad day because Stan was a good guy, big mm -hmm. heart, and a good man. So. Thank you. Yeah. So I just wanted to let the board know about well, that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for letting us know, Bill. Um, well, I've got told you, Bill. Follow, but what's tomorrow night's thing on the roundabout? What, what sort of is the presentation, or is it to just show the map? Or it's uh, going to my understanding. I have only seen bits and pieces of it. It's it's a public hearing. It's going to be a, a basically a, a presentation of what the roundabout's going to look like at Papusik Lake and Truckee Hill Road. Okay. So I I and I intend to be there. Is Good. this a, a public hearing where various ideas are being debated, or is it simply to gather opinions about the one plan? I think it's an I, I can't speak for Kyle. Uh, it's a public hearing. I can only surmise that it's the presentation and feedback. Okay. Okay. okay ultimately, it's gonna. It, it'll. It's gonna. It, it'll, it'll, it'll be the it'll, first step it, in this it, town getting rid of some not putting in more traffic lights. Here, here, here. I agree. I agree. We've put in so, any traffic lights in a long time. They, so yeah. anyway, it's a that was going to be a traffic light if 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 this hadn't been about. Uh, well, you know. never more in a traffic light. Maybe in a long, long time. But I'm glad that they're considering the We're plan considering that they are. It. Yep. I'm also so. glad that the the plan is to present an idea and to receive it back on it and yep. not put two ideas in front of the public and say which one do you like better because yeah. I think that that's a headache. Correct. Um, any other comments or concerns under general items? Um, let me use the opportunity while we've got a TV camera on us to um, 
invite the world that's maybe interested in serving on this board or any other that there are opportunities and there are some openings as alternates and potentially there's always uh, you're never around the corner from when some other uh, vacancy might pop up on on this board um, so if you're interested uh, check with Tim's department and he'll lead you in the right direction to figure out how to put your name forward and if it's not this board, um, there's a whole list of them on the town's website. Absolutely. For opportunities to volunteer for things. Absolutely. Um, I encourage everybody to do that. As we look around, um, you know, five people and we're using an alternate to get to five, um, this should be a seven person board with some alternates. Um, and I know that it's scheduling and people got uh, <laughs> other, other uh, um, things pulling mm -hmm. them in different directions in life. So. I'm not the toughest person on attendance, uh, but I'd love to have uh, oh, some some new vested interest. Meetings. Well, no, I mean I don't. I'm not tough on other people's uh, uh, limitations and things that do that. But if there are folks out there that are interested in serving on the board, we'll find some room for you if you're interested. Come on down. With that, motion uh, to adjourn. No, we're not there yet. Rats. Item seven on our agenda is the approval of the minutes of February eighteenth, twenty twenty. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we amend that we accept the minutes basically as printed, but on item on page one, line twenty nine, as uh, the uh, we've been announced that it's going to be the twenty first instead of April the seventh. Oh yes. Um, so, although that's a change to an announcement, that's not the way you would edit a minute. No, the right. minutes record what occurred at that meeting. That's you're, correct. You're correct. All right, I stand corrected, Mr. Chairman. Therefore, when I make the motion we approve the minutes as printed. Is there a second? I'll second that motion. Uh, all in favor, say aye. Already. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? Abstaining. Four zero one. With Councillor Boyd abstaining. Mm, three zero two. <clears throat> three zero two. I'm sorry, I didn't see you up here. Uh, 302 with Councillor Boyd and Neil Ancatel, um abstaining from consideration of minutes. That concludes our business. I will then second Mr. Boyd's other <laughs> motion, Mr. Chairman. Motion and a second to adjourn. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? 500 to adjourn. Thank you all for the work, um, and don't forget to turn your microphones off. Good thought.